if you'll turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 11. And I warn you, I don't think I ever really woke up this morning. I just started sleepwalking at some point. <laughs> and uh, I was sitting in the car before I came into church wondering why I was so tired. And then I came into church and they asked me what I did yesterday. Then I realized I worked like a 14-hour day yesterday. And I was like, well, maybe that, maybe that might have something to do with it. I don't, I don't know. I, I know there was a TV program called The Walking Dead. I've seen advertisements and, and memes for it. And I had wondered, you know, what it is, and is it just, you know, run-of-the-mill zombie movie, but I'm starting to think that maybe my con condition today might be, you know, somewhat like the contents of the movie. I, th I feel that way anyway, but I'm starting to wake up, and I better not lollygag too long, because, uh, you know, if I take us an hour, Randy will take us another hour, and, you know, and then we might get stoned with pea gravel in the parking lot. But if you'll find Exodus chapter 11... As my, I'm fogging up my glasses just a little bit. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After, afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. Speak now in the hearing of the people and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave uh, the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants, and in the sight of the people. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the handmill, and the firstborn of the animals. Then there will be a great cry, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as was not like it before, nor shall be like it again, but against none of the children of Israel shall a dog move its tongue, against man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes, does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you, after that, I will go out. Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go out of the land. Let's pray. Father, God bless us to understand, Lord, to receive from you, God, the purpose for which you preserved this word, God, the purpose for which you call us to study and to show our, ourselves approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. God, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless us to understand your word, that we might not be deceived. God, that we might have discernment, Lord, that we might have the knowledge of you, God, to know who you are and how you are, God, and able to sp spot a counterfeit. Lord, when we see it and hear it, God bless us to receive what you've prepared for us and what you've preserved for us at the cost of your saints. Bless us in your word this morning, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I think out of this chapter 11, I just want to mention some things about sin, and I titled um, the sermon, When God Broke Sin. Because ultimately, you know, that's what we're looking at, the big picture, the illustration that's in the Old Testament, Egypt, was sin. And God's people there in bondage was people in bondage and slavery to sin. And God was painting this picture. I mean, he spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of lives and, and hundreds of thousands, thousands of years, you know, painting pictures and illustrations and examples by which we may see and understand and know and, and learn from. You know, you imagine, does God want you to know history? Well, he, he literally invented history and used it for the purpose of telling us about him and telling us about our condition and our relationship with him and, and showing us all these things and these illustrations and these pictures 
You know, our best educators today tell us, listen, you just can't give a kid a lecture. His brain isn't really designed to receive information that well, and he won't learn very much. What you need to do is give him an activity and paint him a picture, you know, and give him a story and all. And what do you think that God has done for us? Over and over and over, and with the lectures, and with, you know, along with the lectures, all the illustrations like he recorded in 1 Corinthians 10, these things happen to them as examples for us. And we look, we understand, and it's his people. It's his people where they should not be in bondage to Egypt, or rather in bondage to, in, in slavery to sin. And you know what that looks like for us is you know, somebody who ought to be serving the Lord, but rather than serving the Lord, we're in bondage to whatever sin it may be in our life, and that's what we're living our life for, and we're in that situation until we come to know Christ. And then when you're born again, like John said, like you know, Jesus said in John chapter 3, there's a spiritual birth. There's a receiving of the Holy Spirit of God. There's a sanctifying work which takes you know, place in you, uh, and something is planted, and God begins to grow you as a Christian. You ought to be maturing. And after you receive Christ, and you, you, know, you repent of your sins in that process, and you begin a spiritual growth process. I didn't know anything about this at the age 21. I knew about Jesus on the cross, and you know, and I, you know, but I didn't have any idea. But that, that's God's redemptive work. Redemption doesn't start when you die, and bypass the the great white throne of judgment. Redemption starts when you receive Christ, and the person that you are, or were, or would have been, is redirected, and is changed. I can only imagine what would have become of me. You know, had I not at the age of 21 said, okay, Lord, I want to serve you. And, and gone in that direction instead. And we look at this picture as the whole Egypt, helplessly, they're helplessly in bondage. There's no way they could have delivered themselves. Look at the, at the rigor that it has taken to cause them to come out of Egypt. And there's no way, these were the people that were very afraid even to make a ruckus even to cause problems, you know, and very quick in the beginning they told Moses, no, 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 <laughs> you know, let's, let's call this off, you know, let's not do this. But the rigor that it took, and they were completely unable. You know, man is able to achieve some pretty amazing things. I, I, there's a lady, her name is Melissa Arnott, Melissa Arnott Reed now. She was the first American woman to summit Everest without oxygen. It took her six attempts. And so she's actually been up the mountain six times, but the, but you know, the six times she got it without oxygen, and she's done some other 8,000-meter-plus mountains. But, but an exceptional person would drive and has, and has been able to achieve so much, yet I don't think that she can do anything about her sin. Ask Melissa R. not to stop sinning, and there's no way that she can do it. You know, there's other people. I think about Dan Pena, the son of a of a Mexican immigrant, and, you know, grew up kind of in the barrio, in the hood, and, and that was what he came up in, but he joined the army, became an army officer, and after he got out of the army, became a businessman, and very, not too far into his business life, he became known as a $50 billion man because of a $50 billion deal he made, and, you know, a very accomplished man, uh, one of the wealthiest billionaires in the world today, Yet there's no way, if you ever listen to him, that Dan Pena can do anything about his sin. I think about Dave Goggins, that man who grew up in an unfortunate situation of domestic abuse, was, you know, an, an overweight uh, bug killer, he said, you know, and just so underachieving. And, but something got into him one day, and he decided he was going to be a Navy SEAL, and he did become a Navy SEAL. Took three attempts at Bud's training to become a Navy SEAL, and not only that, he went on to be an Army Ranger. And not only that, he went on to be Air Force Paratrooper. Incredible things. Has done these endurance races, 120 mile an hour, uh, 120 mile an hour, now that would be something, 120 mile races, you know, out in the desert, these incredible things. Yet, if you ever listen to him, it's very obvious that David Goggins can't do anything about his sin. Helen Keller. Blind and deaf, wrote 14 books, hundreds of, of essays and speeches. 
you know, incredible. Louis Braille lost his eyesight, I think, the age nine with one of his father's leather tools and, you know, got infected. The, the infection spread to the other eye and somewhere around the age 10 became completely blind. But then noticed, you know, at those years and, and was practically just unaddressed in public schools and didn't go to school, but sitting on the steps of his porch, he, he began to collect enough knowledge and ability to identify the people walking down the sidewalk based on the sounds that they made. And that was the game that he played, and he would sit there since he wasn't in school, and everybody that walked by, and eventually he got to where he could guess every single person based on the sound. And he went on to create the Braille system. Louis Braille, and he made the Braille system and a whole alphabet and a, and a way to, for blind people to read with the sensation of their fingers. I, you know, I can't, I'm doing good just to tell, is that flush or not? I don't know, i got to look at it. But, to, you know, great accomplishments, but there's one thing that no person, no man, even Mahatma Gandhi, you know, there, there's nothing that we can do about our sin. And what does it take? And, you know, and I think a lot of people, you know, good, well-intended people very much want to do something about it. But if you want to be honest with yourself, sooner or later we come upon ourselves and we realize, man, why am I who I am and why do I do the things that I do? There's not a single one of us who's never been ashamed. Never been embarrassed or ashamed or caught in some kind of a scam or trick or lie. Even, you know, when you're a little kid, there's, there's probably not a single one of us who doesn't have a private detail about our life that we would never want to be made public. That's the truth about who we are and what we are. And the sad truth about that, you know, that, that people come to realize is that there's nothing that we can do about it, that the yoke of bondage and the power of sin that is over us apart from Christ is nothing that anybody can ever overcome. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, is what the Scripture says. There's none righteous, no, not one. And you think about what it took, and we look here and in this picture that God is making. Remember, Egypt is sin, and his people are in bondage to sin. And what did it take to break Egypt to get them to a place to where they would free God's people, and to, so that God's people would no longer be in slavery to sin? <clears throat> Go back, and we look. There's a few things here. And the Lord said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on, on Pharaoh and on Egypt afterward. He will let you go from here when he lets you go. <laughs> you ever notice that, you know, when somebody uses the term when instead of if, sometimes I remember when I went to the hospital one time because of the pain from, uh, oh, what is that called? Diverticulitis. I had so much pain from, I, I didn't know it was diverticulitis, but I learned that day. <laughs> and, uh, I couldn't lift my left leg, you know, because there was so much pain down here. And, and I went to the hospital, and they took my blood pressure, and it was like, you know, 11 million over 5 million or something like that. It was, it, was, it was ridiculous. But I was in a lot of pain, and it goes up even higher. And the doctor said, boy, your blood pressure, you know, that's high. I said, yeah, it's high. It usually is high, and it's really high when I'm in pain. You know, and he kept on coming. He, I was worried about my diverticulitis. He kept on coming back around to the blood pressure. and he said, well, when you get home today, he said, you need to go and you need to buy a blood pressure cuff and you need to start making a log sheet, you know, and, and documenting this stuff. He said, so when you have a heart attack, you know, and I said, wait, wait a second. I said, I, I don't like your word there, you know. <laughs> I, I said, I'd feel much better if you just kept it hypothetical and said, if, if I had a heart attack, I like if much better than when, but, but you all know the cliche, it's not if, it's when. I'm a roofer. I tell people, it's not if you've got to replace your roof, it's when, right? You know? <laughs> right? When. And God didn't say if, he said when. He said when he lets you go. What does that mean that when, when, when it, the back is broken, when the, when the stronghold is overcome, when he finally breaks the hold that, that is on them when it happens. Something about, you know, the judgment, God's judgment on sin, the surety of it is not, a, it's not an if, it's a when. God gave us enough in the book of Revelation, the revelation he gave unto John, that 
You know, there's a very certainty, you know, that God said, then I saw, you know, a throne and him that sat upon it, that great white throne that's given for us. And what did John say? I can't remember just the way he put it. He said, but the small and the tall, right? The poor and the rich and everybody, you know, they're standing before it and the books were open. And the books were open. It's a sure thing. It's a positivity. I'm so glad that when God, when, when, when the Scripture des- describes Christians and the way, you know, what our condition is, like John said, is that when we appear, it shall appear as if we had no sin. And we won't be judged according to our sins, but we'll be judged according to our works in Christ Jesus. You know, if, as if God, you know, put you in an Easter egg hunt, and at the end of the hunt, he wanted to look in your basket. He said, well, I sent you on an Easter egg hunt. Where's your eggs? Sadly, some of us will have an empty basket. Oh, we were on the hunt. We were one of his. Indeed, it's true, but there's some going about this world about the harvest and about laboring and about conditioning themselves and and preparing their vessel and being that person and fulfilling the work of God in their life. And some of us, you know, are are still asleep. If you read the epistles that that Paul and John, that, that they wrote to Christians, and Peter, that they wrote to Christians, you find out very quickly that being a Christian does not, you know, it's not an automated thing that you fall into this productive, God-fearing, you know, Christ-like person, That, but it's something that has to be done and, and worked at, on, you know, in us. But, you know, we can see the judgment of sin, and apart from that, to be apart from that would be a great gift, and to be delivered from that, to be able to overcome that, it's a surety, the, the judgment on, on sin. And if we go down a little further, he says, when he lets you go, when he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here altogether. It's completely. You know, it's completely. And, and sad to say, it's, it's not complete in this life. It, it does take effect. Another thing John said that, you know, <laughs> when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall get to that point that Paul was talking about. He says, I have not attained. What did he mean by attained? You know, attained to perfection, attained to true, perfect Christ's likeness to be sinless. That's what's going to make heaven so good. We're not going to be sinners anymore. That's what's going to make it so wonderful. And you wonder, well, what makes this country bad and what makes this world bad? And, and we walk around this world, you know, pointing at our politics and pointing at other people groups and pointing at this and that and the other and, and religions. And you can all do and And very well, they all cause problems. But really, the very the fundamental principle among all those institutions and situations is the problem is sin. Otherwise, communism would work. But communism can't work because we're sinners. But God's going to judge that completely, thoroughly, totally. It's a surety that He will judge it, and you know, and it, He will judge it when He judges it. He will do it completely. All the books were open. You know what the Lord said? He says, "There's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed." Boy, <laughs> thank you, Lord. When I think about that, he said, there's nothing hidden, but, you know, remember, those who are in Christ Jesus shall appear as if we have no sin. He's not talking about you. He's talking about the great white throne of judgment when the books are open. He said, there's nothing hidden that shall not be revealed in that day, and that God, there's nothing that he's going to forget about. There's nothing that he doesn't know about. In that day, sin will be judged completely. And he said, all together... He said, speak now in the hearing of the people, and let every man ask from his neighbor and every woman from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. You know, just as a side note, when God blesses you with a lot of money, I wouldn't assume it's for Amazon. <laughs> yeah or Bass Pro Shops, or whatever it is. Anything about this, I can only imagine the thoughts that went through so many minds that day when here they are, they're just, you know, turning over their riches. And, you know, what, what would that be like for us? You know, it'd be somebody, hey, you know, here, let me cash up you 10 grand. You know, 
here's my brand new Audi, you know, take it. And just conferring riches and wealth, you know, and, and getting wealth. But, you know, be careful because God had a plan for this. Remember, we're stewards, not owners. You're a manager, right? With what you have and what you're going to do with it. And you know what God's intention, you know what he did with all these riches later? He wanted to build a temple, a, you know, the tabernacle. And that's what that was for so much. And when God blesses you, be careful what you're assuming that it's for and what to do with it. And so he did that, but let's go on to look again about his judgment on sin. Verse 4, Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord about midnight, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. I, I don't know about you, but I want to feel like that's severe. I mean, that is severe, that's tough. My mind automatically and apologetically goes, you know, to the, you know, to the, 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 the Egyptian woman who wanted the Israelites to go already. Maybe she was sympathetic towards them. Maybe she helped them. Her and her husband, you know, were, were helpful to them. But, you know, the severity, the prescription that God wrote was hard. You're like, why was this so hard? Well, you know, I think God likes to turn up your feelings and then cause you to understand what it's about. You know, at us in our, in our own <laughs> humane mind, thinking about the toughness and the severity of it and all that, you know, we overlook the fact of the offense against God, you know, that He, he chose something very hard. And very tough, but you know what it does is it qualifies just really what sin is and the offense that it is against God. And, it, and it's tough for us because we're so unrighteous and He's righteous. And you know, you know what that's like? It's like having a toddler. How many of y'all had this when y'all were, you know, you had this 18 month old that, you know, they're in the next room and they got really quiet. And you're like, oh, I get something, you know, there's something, you know, I need to go find out. And you go in there, and they got their diaper off, and they're painting on the wall. You know, and I'm sorry, it's gross, it's a bit vulgar, but, you know, it, 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 it'll get us there. Hold on just a second. You know, and, and, you know, you're like, look, Mom, look what I did, you know. I'm coloring the wall, you know. Look, it's a picture. And we're just like, ugh. Ooh, you know, no, that's my wall, you know, and that's my carpet, and that's disgusting, and that's, you know, it, hey, this is, it, it, that toddler thinks it's great. And you, you know, and you have to realize, well, wow, and their, and their simplicity and naivety and ignorance and, you know, just their, their juvenile condition, they don't even know what is refuse and what is gross, and, and they don't even know what's of value and what, you know, took work and effort to create and maintain, and they're totally oblivious to the offense. You don't think there's things like that with us and God? Something that just relatively like seems so okay to us and you know so justifiable or or fun or something like that, and God's walking in the room and we got our diaper in our hand and he's like, That's disgusting. That's horrible, that's sick, that's gross. Oh, but it seemed like a good time to us. And it's because our thoughts are not his thoughts and our ways are not our ways. And, and if you want to know, hey, man, have I made my mom and dad mad by, you know, uh, painting on the wall with my diaper contents? Look at the consequence. Look at the consequence that God is trying to send such a strong message to us today. Listen, your sin won't just cause you your health. Your sin won't just cause you your mind. Your sin won't just cause you your relationships in life, your sin will cost you an eternity separated from God. How important is it? Extremely. You know, how is it important for you not to commit first-degree murder? Well, the consequence is death penalty. Mm, that qualifies it a little bit, doesn't it? 
But God is so serious about sin that he never like, you know, passes it off as nothing. But no, he told us the wages of sin is death. He told Adam and Eve in the garden, now you shall surely die. Don't you know, don't you understand the severity of God's judgment on sin, that he can't have anything to do with it, that he's disgusted by it. And he said, well, the firstborn of Egypt shall die. He said, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the hand mill and all the firstborn of the animals. Why did he put that in there? It's just like the great white throne judgment, you know, to the great and the small. That God's judgment on sin is impartial. There's impartiality with it. That it, you know, it does not matter who you are. God, you know, and God never, there's no biblical grounds to say because you had this kind of childhood and these kind of experiences and that kind of PSD and this kind of disorder. And, you know, there's, that God just doesn't give any kind of excuses, does he? You know, I'm afraid that Americans today, as we die, you know, we might show up and he's like, you know, but God, ADA, DPT, you know, and, and we start giving all the reasons for the reasons why, you know, and I, I don't find any grounds for that, that, you know, when God judges sin, it's impartial, it's across the board. And that's something I think is very sobering. To, to, to come to mind and to realize and to understand that there's, there's impartiality. That day when he brought judgment on sin, he said it's going to be for Pharaoh's son and it's going to be for the son of the woman grinding at the mill. And he said that you may know that the Lord does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Now here's some great news, that it's avoidable. <clears throat> there were those there who were going to avoid this judgment on sin. And actually, since the fourth plague, they had avoided uh, this judgment that God had brought in the form of ten judgments. And you know that's because they were in Him. They were His. They were God's people. They were sanctified. They were set apart. And of course, this is the picture of it. it is, but we know very well today, you know what that is? That is moving you know, from the kingdom of this world into His kingdom receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, surrendering your life to Him, you know, stepping out, you know, removing yourself from that becoming one of His people. You know, when it speaks about Abraham and the Jews, you know how the, the Bible speaks about those of us who are Gentiles. He said that we were grafted in. And, you know, for any of y'all who don't want to know what grafting is, grafting is, you know, when you go to a tree, and maybe you'll go to a native pecan tree, and you use the native trunk and the native base, and out of the vascular tissue in the side of a small limb, you cut a little notch, you know, in, in a little slot into that, and then you take another limb that's from a hybrid tree, a nice tree. You know, it's got paper shell, what we call, you know, thin shell pecans, and, and you can, you know, carve that limb to match the vascular tissue and you put it into place and you wax it and you wrap it and you put it there and then it grows. That vascular tissue, amazingly enough, it, it lines up and it connects itself and it fixes itself and that tree, it's just, you know, we, we thought we were, you know, getting really good in the medical industry about, you know, this limb and that limb and they've been doing this in plants for thousands of years, but it said that we were grafted in. And just as Abraham, by faith, believed God, it says that so you and I, too, can be sons of Abraham, you know, in faith, and that we believe him, and that we are grafted in, that we become one of the people of God, and that we avoid this judgment on sin, that it's avoidable. And how was it avoidable? I'll leave you with that. He said that, uh, that God does make a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. You know, and maybe I already said it, but that's a good place to say, do you know that if you're in Christ Jesus, that you will never be judged for your sin? I know I already said that, but if you're in Christ Jesus, you will be, never be judged for your sin. The li Scripture literally says that we will be, appear as if we had no sin. Those of us who are in Christ will go to something we call the Bema Seat Judgment where we will be judged, I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, is a good place to go and to look and, and to know what that is, our works in Christ Jesus. And he said that, that God makes a difference between the Egyptians and Israel, and he says, And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow to me, saying, Get out, and all the people who follow you, after that I will go out. 
Then he went out from Pharaoh in great anger. I wonder. <laughs> I sat there and wondered why. And the, and the cost, you know, of being involved in something like that, in a situation like that, I feel pretty certainly that Moses' anger was to be such a close witness to so much pain and anguish for the hard-heartedness and arrogance of man. You know, we, we see that in the East right now because of racism and bitterness and and you know, between people, that there's so much pain and suffering. And it's hard to be in the middle of something like that. You know, I, you probably know of situations where grandparents had to watch, you know, their own incompetent kids be careless with their grandkids. And a very difficult thing. And a hard thing to watch go down. And I think about the, the pain of giving this pronouncement. Remember, Moses was not far from Egyptian culture. For 40 years, he was an Egyptian. I mean, he was more of an Egyptian for 40 years than he was a Jew. Grew up in Pharaoh's house. Was mighty in words and deeds. You think he was just some anonymous guy on a you don't think that meant something? You don't think that those of you who are older now, if you went back to where you resided 40 years ago and then had to give a pronouncement like this, that, listen, all of your firstborn shall die. There were people that he knew very personally whose children died. And for the hardness of heart and for the bitterness that, you know, in the heart of man and the sinfulness of man, you know, it will make you angry. And it can be a righteous anger. It can be, you know, righteous indignation, you know, and, and angry for the right reasons. You know, the Scripture says to be angry and sin not. And don't assume that all anger is sinful anger, but even the Lord Himself demonstrates anger, righteous anger for us. But He went out in great anger. He said, But the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not heed you, so that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. So Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And he did not let uh, the children of Israel go out of the land. <clears throat> now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be the beginning of months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Now this was not normally their first month. This was the seventh month. And it was Tishri that was the first month, and this is Aviv or Nisan was the Babylonian term for uh, Aviv. And, but God reset the calendar. And that becomes a little difficult. You go back and, well, so guess what, what day the ark, because it gives you, the, God gave the exact date, the ark came to land. Guess what day it was? The 17th, Resurrection Day. You know, I don't know that we have it in Scripture, but it's, it's in uh, Jubilees that the day that Abraham offered Isaac was very near to this day. This day, you remember he said on the 10th day, you take it the 15th, you know, you slaughter it, you know, the 17th, and you go through those dates, and God begins now. You know, he began way back with the ark, and he also showed it in Abraham and Isaac, and he shows it again now here just how he's going to make the judgment on sin avoidable in your life. How he put things together, how he shows redemption, how he shows salvation over and over, and he stopped the hand of Abraham and he said, I'll provide a ram. I'll provide a ram and I'll provide a new way and I'll provide a way out. And he, he started giving the instructions here and that's all I'm going to cover of it today, but it's going to be avoidable. And listen, if you think, if you think that that is just, so brutally harsh of God to bring that judgment, the death of the first, on the firstborn of all Egypt, I will tell you that he did not give himself any less of a judgment on sin. Absolutely 100% the same degree 
the same severity, the punishment that sin took, that whatever, uh, I guess it'd be like 3,800 years ago now, something like that. You know, even 1,800 years after that, there was, there was judgment. And there was judgment on sin for all of us who believe in Christ Jesus. And that judgment was placed on guess who? A first son. I know the scripture says an only begotten son, but he's also a first son. Do you know that? The Lord Jesus Christ was the only begotten because he had the begottenness of the Father. But in Romans chapter 8, that he said that he predestined us to become conformed unto his likeness. Why? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He was the firstborn, God's only and God's first. And guess where the judgment of our sin was laid? On God's firstborn. I'll leave that there, and I'll give time to Randy, but I'll close this in prayer here. Father, God, we... We thank you for your demonstration for your evidence, for your proof. That there's none of us that know any pain and anguish and greater than you. And I don't want to pretend like here we are on earth having to suffer and deal with these things and as if you don't know what it's like. But Lord Jesus, you put on this flesh and you suffered in every way and in every way was tempted yet without sin. Lord, we want the full effect of that payment made and that sanctifying work. And God, that the remainder of all of our lives might be unto you, Lord, and for, and for wise things for loving things, for good things, God, for your purpose. I pray for our brother Randy as he comes, God. Lord, that you just might put your spirit upon him, God, for your purpose. Our edification, God. I pray that we may remember and show your death well today, Lord, as we partake of this. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we ask. Amen.